Thank you, Sarah Barton. Friends, the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And I want to start this morning with a question. How many of you in this room do not consider yourselves Native Americans? Raise your hand if you're not an American. Raise your hand really high, really high, really high. Everybody look around, look around. We call ourselves the American Church in Paris, and we're happy to call ourselves that. <laughs> but, but this is a church, this is a multicultural, multilingual, multi-denominational church where we, in all of our diversity, in the beauty of our different backgrounds, find our unity, our commonality in Jesus Christ who loves us and gives us a common identity as brothers and sisters in Christ. So we're so glad that you are here with us as we continue on this post-Easter sermon series where we are asking questions. And we're trying to answer the question that Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? Friends, as a sign of our unity, despite our beautiful diversity, let us now stand together using the words of our call to worship, to join in worship. Words are printed in your bulletin. Give thanks to our risen Lord this holy day. Today we celebrate anew the wondrous hope and joyous promise of a new life lived in the presence of our risen Lord. Let us join in the Korean creed and affirm our faith. Words are printed in the bulletin. We believe in one God, creator and sustainer of all things, father of all nations, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, 
and Redeemer, the Savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the church, those who are unit living, Lord, for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God as the divine will realized in human society and in the family of God where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Well, Napoleon, here we are again, and you said that you wanted to invite all the kids up today, so now it's your turn, okay? All right, okay. Hey, kids, come on up for the children's moment, okay? You get to see me, and we'll talk a little bit about, about Jesus today. Come on up. Come on, kids. Well, that was very good, Napoleon. You did a good job with that. Thank you. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Hello. Nice to see you. Hi, everybody. Hi there. Hi. How are you? Well, Napoleon, it's very nice to have you with us today. Thanks for coming to be with the children. Hi. Come on up. Good to see you. Hi. Hi. So you told me earlier that you had a question. Yeah. Uh, I thought we could ask the kids. Um, what do you think that Jesus looked like when he was a little boy? What do you think Jesus looked like when he was a little boy? Any ideas? Not like we look right now, for you, sure. For sure? Okay. How about others? What did Jesus look like when he was a little boy? Well, one thing I think that Jesus looked like as a little boy was just like all of you, that Jesus looked just like all of you, a, a little boy uh, uh, ready to go out and, and play, and if they had a children's time in a synagogue, he probably came up for that too. But it's very special. And, but we don't really know what Jesus looked like. I mean, you know, just really, this is a photograph of Jesus. We don't have that. Uh, but we have all of us, and, and we reflect back that vision of Jesus. But it's probably not so important, though, Napoleon, about what Jesus looked like, but um, who he is today for us. So when we think about Jesus today, we think about the Jesus that we read about in the Bible. Now you think, well, that was a long time ago when he said all those things. But all those things that he taught us are still very, very important for us today. So as you are growing up um, and reading the Bible with, on your own or with your family, you're going to read these stories about Jesus. And then you want to do, what you want to do is you want to think, well, if I put myself in that story, what would it be like for me? And what does it teach me? Because Jesus is a great teacher. Isn't that right? Yes, it is. And, you know, I also thought about this. What happens, like, when, when you're afraid? When you're afraid, well, I think that you can pray to Jesus. You know what? I think he's going to be right at your side Sort of like a, a big brother all through our lives, yeah. So, thank you, Napoleon, for that question, and thanks for sharing. Let's uh, stop with a word of prayer, shall we? Oh, loving God, we give you thanks for this day and for the presence of Jesus in our lives. Help us to follow him with, uh, with joy and love. 
And we pray it in his name today. Amen. Okay, now, you guys get to go off to uh, children's worship. You're going to follow Miss Mala. See, she's right back there. You're going to go down to G7. And parents, you're invited after the worship service to go downstairs in the basement in G7 and gather up all the kids. And so it's great to have you with us today. Thank you for coming up. And friends, as the children are leaving... As the children are leaving, there's somebody sitting next to you or around you, and you may not know their name. So as, as you share the passing of Christ's peace with each other, won't you just introduce yourself with your name and, and repeat that and say, hello, Bob, Christ's peace to you. And now, friends, I invite you to stand and share each other the Christ, peace of Christ. Today's first scripture is taken from Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 to 6, and it can be found on page 792 of your Pew Bibles. Now, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and proclaim his message in their cities. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come? Or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those with skin disease are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. This is the word of the Lord.
Amen. Thank you, Bells. That was beautiful. Friends, would you join me in a time of centering prayer? If you are comfortable, I invite you just to um, close your eyes. Feel your body in the pew. Allow yourself to roll your shoulders back. There are certain plants in our world that are called heliotropic plants. And that just means that they make themselves available to the sun. They move like a sunflower as the sun crosses the sky to make sure they catch the rays. Dear God, we confess to you that we spend too many of the hours of our days with our heads down. God, we confess to you that we are too often too busy in our minds, thinking, worrying, planning. Christ, we pray that you would shine down upon us and, and that you would be among us and that you would help us to open ourselves up, open the leaves of our hearts, open our faces, open our minds, to face you, to hear your words, to experience your truth, and to be changed. God, we give ourselves to you and we thank you, we thank you for how you continually give yourself to us. In Jesus' name, all of God's people said, amen, amen. Not very long ago, there was an old, wise, beloved seminary professor. He taught New Testament. And he taught for decades, and his students really appreciated him. He came to the last of his classes in his long tenure, and he gave his final lecture. And as he did so, all the students in the lecture hall stood up and began to applaud him. And he made his way to the door, and as he did, he stopped. He's a New Testament professor. And he looks back at everybody and he asks them to be quiet one more time and he says, if you remember just one thing that I have taught these last 40 years, remember this, that Jesus is the question to all of your answers. Jesus is the question to all of your answers. What a fascinating thing to say. What an interesting way to think about Jesus. We are in this sermon series where we are trying to explore the identities of Jesus as Christ asks his disciples, his followers, who do you say I am? And as for as many people are in this room, my guess is we would get that many different questions. It's a good question to be asked. Jesus was a question asker. And yet, most of us, I can speak for myself, most of us come to church, come to Jesus, because we need an answer. We turn to Jesus when we realize that the, the hope that we thought we had, or the identity that we had taken so long to build, all of a sudden falls away, and we turn to Jesus looking for an answer. Or the security that we thought that we had amassed in our lives all of a sudden disappears or we see it slipping out of our hands, we turn to Jesus looking for an answer. And I want to assure you of this. Jesus is the answer that you are looking for. Jesus is the answer that we are looking for. There's a... Uh, church father from Africa, his name was Augustine of Hippo, or Augustine. 1,600 years ago, he put it this way. He said, each one of us is born with a Christ-shaped hole in our hearts. And we go the length of our days trying to fill that hole until we find Jesus. Other poets have put it this way. They've said that our hearts are restless 
until we find our rest in Christ, in, in our understanding that we are God's beloved children in Christ. Jesus is the answer. Last week I sat right up here on a bar stool and I shared with you my testimony and what Jesus means to me. And I explained to you that, that Jesus is everything to me. And Jesus has walked with me and held me. And I've been held up by the prayers and the faith of my brothers and sisters as I have gone through some of the darkest and most difficult seasons of my life. And I have walked with Jesus and with others to experience the world, to experience sublime, full-hearted joy in ways that I never could have imagined. And I experience on a daily basis a deep-rooted peace because of the answer that I have found in Jesus Christ. And I thank God for it. Most of the time, when we go looking for Jesus, we honestly find Jesus in each other. We are all filled with the Spirit of Christ. We are all Christ to each other. We are, as we say here at the American Church, the hands and the feet, the face of Christ to each other. So oftentimes, you are all Christ to me. With a smile, or a note, or an email, a prayer, we are Christ to each other. We find Christ in each other. We, some of us find Christ more in the world as we are out and we open ourselves like a heliotropic plant to recognize and to receive the truth, the beauty of God's love of Jesus Christ that's revealed to us in the world. But probably most of us, at least the first time that we recognize and come into relationship with Jesus and turn to Jesus, find him in the scriptures. And as we experience Jesus in the Gospels, it is very, very interesting that as you read about Jesus and the life of Jesus in the Gospels, it's interesting to notice how it is that Jesus is the answer. How is it that Christ is the answer to those who seek him in the Gospels? He has a way of sneaking in or breaking into the life of into the hearts of us, and he helps us to find the answers. But strangely enough, or perhaps we should say wisely enough, Jesus does this not by walking around handing out answers to questions, but instead through telling stories and asking questions. Lots and lots and lots of questions. I've just recently been reading this book, Jesus is the Question, and within it, Martin Copenhaver quotes numerous scholars who have studied the Gospels, and it came as a bit of a shock to me, and I think it might to be a shock to you as well, that as you read through the four counts of Jesus' life in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this is what you will find. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus asks others over 300 different questions. Jesus is asked 183 questions. And depending on the scholars, Jesus actually answers somewhere between three and eight answers. Jesus is asked many questions. Jesus asks even more questions. But if you're looking for the simple answer, man, you might be a little bit frustrated if you turn to Jesus Christ. Jesus is not the great answer man. He is the great questioner. Even when Jesus is asked a question, more often than not, his response is with what? Another question. The title of our sermon series comes from one of the most powerful questions, Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And just before that, he had asked them a previous question, who do others say that I am? Jesus is the question to all of our answers. So why is it that the God of the universe, when God became flesh, we're not quite yet ready for that slide, why is it that when the God of the universe became flesh, he asked so many questions? 
Why would that be? Why did he answer so many questions with another question? Well, here we go. As author Lauren Winter has put it, this is what wise teachers do because questions force us to do things. Questions do powerful things that answers can't. I'll take that slide now. Questions do powerful things that answers can't. When someone asks a question, it forces us to stop and think. Questions engage us with the other person. If someone just tells you something, you can sit back and passively take it in and receive it or not. But a question draws you in. It requires your attention. It requires a response. It inspires you to think, to ask other questions, perhaps to pull together previous information you hadn't before, to discover something new. Questions are powerful. Questions also deepen shared interests around a subject. Next slide. Questions deepen a shared interest around a question or a subject. Questions forge and build intimacy. Questions after question after question can lead you down a path and help you to see links between things you'd never seen before. Questions disarm us. Questions shift us out of accusatory mode and into listening mode. Questions move us from being a critic to an engaged discoverer. Questions move us from judgment to curiosity. As any excellent teacher or therapist knows, good questions transform us from within. And that's the only transformation that truly lasts. Jesus was an excellent teacher, an amazing therapist. But if we're looking for simple answers in Jesus, we might be disappointed. He doesn't provide a lot of easy answers. Instead, he asks again and again, engaging, challenging, transformational questions, questions that force us to think deeply, to feel deeply, and to change the way we live and view life. The earliest story we have of Jesus' life after his birth is found in only one gospel. That's the Gospel of Luke. And it is the story of Jesus as an adolescent. And thus, Napoleon asking the kids the question, what did Jesus look like when he was a little guy? This is the story of Jesus when he was about 12 years old that's told in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. Jesus and his extended family who live in the northern part of Israel, up by the, lake, the Sea of Galilee, it's about a three-day journey down to Jerusalem. And they would make that journey once or twice a year, especially for the high holy days, and it was Passover. And so the people from Nazareth and Capernaum in that area went down, made their way down together, and it was always safer to travel in groups. And so Jesus and his family, and I don't know what culture you come from or your nationality, but in different countries we define family different. For some of us, family is two or three people. For some of us, family is 40 or 50 people, right? Jesus would be in the latter group. His family and friends were on their way down from Nazareth to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And what I want you to do is listen to what happens and pay attention to what Jesus is saying and how even he answers questions that are asked to him. Let us listen now for God's spirit to speak to us in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 41. Now, every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, he went up as usual for the festival. Now, they talk about going up because Jerusalem was always, the temple was always seen as kind of the high point. So metaphorically, you always ascend to the temple. You ascend to Jerusalem even if you were coming downhill or coming down the, um, the Jordan River. Now, when the festival had ended and the family started to return, the boy, the 12-year-old, stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents were unaware of this. Assuming he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey back home. 
This might be a little bit of a commentary on helicopter parenting, friends. It took them a day to realize their 11-year-old wasn't with them. They trusted that somebody somewhere was taking care of them. All was well. But once they did realize that Jesus was not with them, they started to turn back. And they looked for him among the relatives and friends. When they could not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. Verse 46. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers. What was he doing there? He was listening to them and asking them questions. They found Jesus in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed by his understanding and his answers, it says. But I wonder if, again, some of Jesus' answers to their questions were more questions. And they were amazed. Now, when his parents saw him there, they were astonished. And his mother called out to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. We have been anxiously looking for you, Jesus. And Jesus looks up and he asks them a question. Why were you searching for me? Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But his parents didn't really understand what he said to them. And then he went down with them and they came to Nazareth and he was obedient to his mother and father. But his mother treasured up all of these things in her heart. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Perhaps it is the most important question that Jesus asks each one of us, asks you today, Why? Why are you here? Why are you searching for me? What are you looking for? In coming to Jesus, what are you looking for? What do you want? What are you... What are you looking for? It's a good question, friends. Because if we're looking for a quick answer, if we're looking for something we can cut and paste into our lives to solve a quick problem and move on, we will most likely be disappointed. But if you are coming to Jesus, if you are looking for healing, for deep healing, if you're looking for meaning, if you are truly desiring change in a new way of seeing what is true in the world, making sense of life, if that's why you are coming to Jesus, then I believe Jesus is the answer. The answer who will draw you into this new reality through transformational questions. Questions that lead to life-changing answers. The other thing that I've always thought is fascinating is to see who it is in the scriptures that gets the most upset by Jesus. Jesus is God in the flesh, showing up, talking to people, touching people, loving people, teaching people, asking questions. And some people are drawn to him and are asking the right questions, and and their lives are touched and changed, and other people get pretty mad. There are other people that get pretty ticked off pretty quickly. And it's interesting to note, who are those people, and when am I potentially like them? (laughs) And how do I not be that way? It's fascinating to recognize who is most frustrated by Jesus and also therefore doesn't recognize who he is. And over and over throughout the Gospels, it is the scribes and the Pharisees who are the most angry, who feel the most threatened. And why is that? Because they are the ones who have the answers. They're the ones who know. 
They've studied the law. They know the answers. And so when people come to them with questions, they give those answers. And here is Jesus asking these annoying questions, doing things that they, the Pharisees and the scribes, they can prove from the scriptures are not appropriate because they have the answers. Sometimes I wonder which kind of person I am. Am I the person who thinks that I have got it figured out enough that I have the answer, or am I truly coming to Jesus with an open heart, humility? A few chapters later in Luke's telling of Jesus' story in Luke chapter 6, Jesus is older, maybe 30 years old or so. And there's a story that Luke tells about Jesus who heals a man who has a withered hand. We don't know what that means, if it was a form of palsy or a a birth defect or paralysis, but clearly somebody whose hand was withered and therefore couldn't work, most likely was a beggar. And because they were deformed, they actually couldn't enter into the temple because there was a level of perfection that was necessary to enter into the inner temple gates. And so Jesus is there and he sees this man with a withered hand And he heals him. And Luke says, from a distance, the scribes and the Pharisees were watching to see whether would Jesus would cure this man on the Sabbath. It was Saturday. And they were looking to see if Jesus would cure this man on the Sabbath so that they might be able to find grounds to bring an accusation against Jesus. But what did Jesus do? He touched the man. He cured his withered hand. And then it says he stood with the man in the middle of the temple and he asked the scribes and Pharisees a question. Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? What do you think God would say? We all know the answer to that question. But the scribes and the Pharisees did not like that answer. And so it says they began to plot together to destroy Jesus. Jesus was the question to all of their answers, but they wouldn't let him be. And so, friends, the question that Jesus brings to us today is how do we come to Jesus? What are we looking for? Are we just on occasion shooting up Prayers to heaven, hoping for quick solutions. Are we looking for a God who actually will just confirm what we already know to be true? A God who will give answers that already match our answers? Because if that is how we go to God, we will probably hear and see exactly what we want to hear and see. How do we come to Jesus? And the question is, are we looking for an answer or are we looking for a relationship? A relationship that will change us and humble us. That will make us more loving, more gracious, more generous, more forgiving, more like Jesus. I think those are the questions we need to ask ourselves. Jesus reveals the desires of our hearts by asking you, by asking me, the same 300 questions today that he asked throughout the Gospels. And I want to finish my sermon this morning by simply asking some of them to us all. And so if you feel comfortable, I would encourage you to close your eyes or just position yourself and imagine Jesus standing in front of you, asking you some questions. Jesus asks, if you love only those who love you, What reward is there in that? Dear woman, why are you crying? What is it you were arguing about on your journey here? Which of you standing here is without one sin? Why 
Why? Why are you so afraid? Why do you spend so much time worrying about clothing and food? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I ask? Friend, what is your name? Do you want to be healed? Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Jesus, they said, we have been anxiously looking for you. And Jesus answers them with a question. Why? Why were you searching for me? Friends, may God help us find the humility, the honesty, to come to Jesus with open hearts, not just to find answers, but to be saved, to be healed, to be knit together and transformed, to find a hope and an identity that is real and lovely and eternally true. That is what Jesus has for each one of us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Jesus' people, I invite you into a time of prayer. O oh God of resurrection and new life, we are grateful for your mighty presence in our lives and in our world. As we gather today, we witness our world in great need of healing and restoration. Wars rage not for justice sake, but for power and land, and sadly, from a hatred for brothers and sisters. And so we pray that the leaders of nations will once again open themselves to your peaceful presence and bring an end to the violence and vitriol. And Jesus, our communities are divided too, and we pray for understanding and mutual care and love to prevail, just as you taught us, so that our lives may be lived in harmony and beauty. And today we open our hearts to all those who are suffering, illness, grief, sadness, loss, May our prayers lead us to action, to come to their side with care and compassion. 
And yes, today we celebrate once again the changing of seasons, the flowers blooming, the trees leafing out, the nourishing rains, the warm sunshine, all signs that we begin afresh each and every day. So, dear Lord, help us to live the questions. Help us to take your questions deep into our hearts that we may be transformed by those questions into the love and peace and mercy and justice that you so ardently desire from us all. And so in this Easter season, we give thanks for the risen Christ who animates our living with peace and mercy, forgiveness and love, all signs of life eternal. And now we join together to pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, it's my delight this morning, before we take our offering, to share with you a little bit in the life of the church um, and opportunities that you might want to consider as you uh, live out your, your faith here at the American Church in Paris. First of all, I'm going to just name a few things, but you can find about all of that's going on in this little booklet that's available in our fellowship time following the service that's on our welcome table. You're welcome to take one of these and take a look at it, and you'll f maybe see a way that you'd like to get involved in some of these things, and you're invited to do so. But today, um, our class for Bring Your Own Bible continues after this service um, at 12.30 in the pastor study, and Pastor Paul has a lot of questions for you. <laughs> but uh, that will happen today at 12.30. And it will also be on Zoom. If you know somebody that would like to watch that, that isn't here today, let them know that it's on Zoom. Um, the Women's Fellowship today also meets uh, at 1215 in the Thurber Room up on the second floor. And uh, women are invited to attend that. Uh, really, that's been such a great blessing to the ministry of the church and to all those who attend. And then also today after this service, another opportunity, and that's a docent tour. And uh, at, uh, during a docent tour, you get to learn about the history and the stories about ACP. And I think if you are interested in that, I know you'll find that a blessing. You'll learn about the windows and all kinds of great stuff. Uh, and I think you would enjoy that. Today, there's no youth program because Pastor Elizabeth is away on a retreat. Um, and also today, after the service is over, if you'd like to have prayer, one of our uh, prayer team members will be available in the chapel right here to share a word of prayer with you. And finally this, the Olympics are coming, the Paris Games are coming, and we all know that, and we all know that we will be impacted. But one of the wonderful things that's happening about that is on May 12th, that's a Sunday, the the television crews are going to come into church and film our worship service at 10 a.m. And there's only going to be one worship service that day at 10 a.m. And that service will be recorded, but then broadcast as a live service in July. It will be broadcast all over Europe on France TV. So uh, it's going to be quite a, 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 an amazing service. There'll be uh, dig dignitaries here and Olympians as well as uh, pastors from uh, in the Paris area. So mark that on your calendar, May 12th for 10 a.m. for this really, really special worship service where we get to show um, all of Europe 
what we're all about here at the American Church. And friends, now I invite us to uh, share generously as our ushers receive our morning offering. O oh God, the source of all goodness and blessings, we present our tithes and offerings. May these offerings we bring today 
be a reflection of our love for you and our desire to be faithful stewards of your blessings. Bless our giving and guide us in using these gifts wisely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My fellow travelers, brothers and sisters in Christ, I invite you, if you can stick around, to join us for coffee and some snacks right through those doors. If you need prayer, more information about how to take another step, maybe in your journey or your conversation with Jesus can be found with the information that is there. Um, but wherever you go from this place, take this blessing with you. May the Lord God bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace, draw you into the conversation, transform us all to be more like Jesus. Amen. Amen.